Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. In today's video I continue with part 3 of the 124th Airfix Spitfire. Parts 1 and 2 are linked above, and this deals with the mighty Merlin engine. To start with there are three pages of instructions dealing with the build if you're not going to expose the engine, but we're not doing that, so we pick up at step 136. This starts with us cementing the main engine block, which fits perfectly and goes together with no issues, though it's worth test fitting in advance as it can be a little tricky to hold the pieces, so experiment to see which way you find easiest. Next up in 137 we have another three part assembly with a starboard bank of six cylinder head blocks which easily goes together with some Tamiya extra thin as usual. Step 138 adds the two piece auxiliary pump on the left, followed by the air compressor as part K81. As we've seen on the other areas of the kit before, these can be a bit fiddly due to their size but nothing untoward. Step 139 then repeats 137 for the port bank, which doesn't require the additional add-ons. We then move on to the supercharger inlet manifold assembly in steps 140 and 141, which is absolutely straightforward. Step 142 makes the two cylinder block assemblies with the manifold. And then in 143 we bring that assembly onto the main engine block to create the central part of the Merlin's V12. Step 144 sees us fit the connectors to the cooling system header tank, and here I'd advise that you put these on in steps 138 and 139, since getting these pipes in place when the block is already assembled is unnecessarily fiddly, and I don't see any reason to wait until it's complete to do it. We then move on to the supercharger coupling with step 145 and 146, which are straightforward assemblies. We add that coupling to the engine block in step 147, which I found a perfectly snug fitting. One forty eight sees us make the cooler header tank itself, which goes together fine, but does have a prominent seam which I'll return to later. Step 149 would have us put the drive gearbox onto the header tank, but I didn't as I want to deal with that seam first. What I elected to do instead in step 150 was to trim the tab off the gearbox to the header tank, 
put the prop drive shaft in and cement the gearbox cover to the engine. The header tank can fit on the cooling ports later without any issues once it's been smoothed off. Next we are on to the construction of the intercooler, which is basically 5 out of 6 sides of a box covered over 2 stages in 151 and 152. Prominent internal stops makes this a pain free process. In 153 we make the main supercharger assembly. In 154, we add the intercooler to the main supercharger. And then in 155, we bring the entire supercharger assembly onto the main engine. This all fits flawlessly, which is a really good part of this. If you wanted to construct the engine in sub-assemblies, you absolutely could, and still have everything come together with no seams or gaps. Steps 156 through 160 deal with the whole air intake and carburetor assembly that has a whole bunch of bits and bobs on it and which provide no issues in putting together. ending with it attached to the main supercharger body. Step 161 moves us into the more fiddly items on the engine, with this one connection on the oil filters being one of the ones I spent most time on. Piece K15 attaches to the engine with no issues, but the line to the oil filters needs holding in place for some time before it will stay in place. The other parts in 161 to 163 offer no real issues other than being a little bit fiddly at times, but nothing a pair of tweezers and some patience can't solve. So now it's time to go back to that coolant header tank. I've applied sprue goo to the seam, now it has dried, I sanded it smooth before attaching it to the two cooler pipes on the engine. Part K80 is a bit of a pain since all six lines need to go into the engine before you can seat it properly, and it does require a bit of cleanup to aid in this and to remove seam lines. Once all lines are in however, they're deep enough to hold the part for cementing. I expect this is one area that some people will want to replace, though the kit part is perfectly adequate. Step 165 repeats this process for the other side. Step 166 does a similar process for the top of the engine, but getting the lines in and attached to the prior assembly is more complex than it looks, and this is a fairly delicate part that you don't want to break, especially as it does require a bit of cleanup. Eventually it goes into place, but this certainly wasn't a fun step. The next part in 167 is much less problematic. The main thing to watch for here is alignment with the prior part, so you don't develop any seams.
168 and 169 see us finish off the attachments to the engine block itself, and that doesn't present any issues at all. So with that, let me have a quick word. Firstly, a huge thank you to those of you who have subscribed to the channel. And I hope that if you're one of the approximately 90% who watch my videos without subscribing, that I'll earn your sub by the end of this video. If you do subscribe, make sure to set the notification bell to all, so you don't miss any future videos as well. Secondly, there have been a lot of comments on what materials and tools I use and where you can get those. I do have an Amazon store linked in the video notes below for all of those things. And if you order anything through that link at all, I do get a small commission, which I put back into the channel. So that really helps me out. On the subject of comments, I really appreciate your engagement with the channel through these. I do read them all and try to reply to them all in a reasonable time frame too. Please do keep the comments coming, though I won't be changing any valid English pronunciations I make, however amusing to an international audience they may be decals being the most popular one, but I do try to take any constructive criticism, suggestions and ideas on board. Lastly, I do have both a Patreon and YouTube memberships for the channel if you'd like to support me directly. These give you some additional benefits such as behind the scenes video content, access to my Discord server, merch and so on, and I'll also be doing regular giveaways for kits, hobby tools and the like. The big one for this year is for every 75 Patreons or channel memberships, I'll be giving away one of these Airfix 124 scale Spitfire kits, so if you like what you see here and have a couple of pounds a month to donate, you could end up being lucky and owning this kit. I'm going to jump ahead now to 171 to create the hydraulic reservoir tank. Simple but be careful of the tiny filler cap, which is a prime candidate for the carpet monster. I actually attached mine and then cleaned it up in situ to minimize handling and potential loss. 172 is another simple two-part assembly for the engine firewall that we're making and setting aside until after it's painted. We can then skip ahead once more to step 174, where we form the engine mount using the engine as a jig. This is actually much easier than I was expecting, and the pieces go together without any issues again, and barely needing the engine to guide their formation. Step 175 adds the lower bracing, which again is added without any real issues. The main thing here is to make sure the assembly is hitting all the correct places on the engine and then leave it to dry completely before trying the next step. I say this because the next step, number 176, is the worst so far in the kit, specifically piece K74. This is a cooling pipe that runs down the internal framing, but because there's a cross brace on the frame it needs to be threaded in and then out between this framing. As the frame is more delicate than the pipe, this is both frustrating and potentially going to end up with something broken. The problem is not one of construction order, since the problem would be the same if you tried with just those two parts alone. In the end, you have to gently bend one or both parts to thread it through. The good news is once on, it locates very easily and cements in place. The other cooling pipe doesn't suffer from this issue as there's no cross brace. One seventy one sees us add additional pipes to the framework, and these also require a bit of threading through to get right. It is possible to put them through backwards, so test fit carefully. That nightmare over. I'm skipping ahead once again, this time to 181, to create the two-part hydraulic filter, which is very simple. Then to 184 and 185 to make the cowling integrated oil tank. In retrospect, there are a couple of seams on this part that really need dealing with now, but I didn't, as you'll see through the build.
Next I jump forward to step 192 and the oil cooler intake, another simple two part assembly. Jumping further ahead still, I'm assembling the props. These are two part assemblies that result in a noticeable seam, so I carefully filled with a thin sprue goo for later cleanup. Steps 240, 242 and 243 deal with the rear of the propeller assembly, and again, all go together with no real issues. Now, time for some painting. I sprayed everything with aluminium and anti-shine as before, and applied chipping fluid before airbrushing. I'm once again using an overall coat of Hakata Hobby's RAF interior grey green, and including all the internal components other than the main engine. This includes the cowling oil tank, which is indicated as being silver, but period photos also show it being in interior green. The engine I'm going over with matte black, I'll seal it with pledge to give a semi-gloss appearance after I'm done paint chipping. Whilst I have black in the airbrush, I'm also giving the machine guns and cannons their undercoat too. Now I'm not really using the chipping fluid on the engine to create wear, but to expose those elements that should be bare metal, like the coolant header tank. I'm doing this in the same way, by wetting the area and using the brush to remove the paint. More stubborn areas get treatment with a cocktail stick. I'm also using this to remove the paint on the screw heads, on the engine blocks, and some of the other components that should also be metal. On the framing and other interior painted areas, I am using it to create wear as normal. Some pieces do require some detail painting or different colours, like the cooler pipes which are brass, and various pieces that are black, such as the part of the fuselage behind the spinner I'm painting here. Once the parts are all suitably painted and chipped, we can go back to the assembly sequence at step 170 and add these pieces to the main engine firewall. This now prepares us to go back to an even earlier step and to add the lower wing assembly to the fuselage. I'm using Contactor again for its longer working time and making sure we have a good bond as this is obviously a crucial step. Note that you can't put the engine on the fuselage without the wing since the cooling pipes go through the main spar structure. Step 180 brings the engine in which fits best, sliding the supercharger through first, and then locating the cooling pipes into the header tank. The actual engine mounts sit flawlessly if you do this. 191 has us fit the hydraulic filter, which is again trickier than you'd imagine. I found attaching the pipe to the intercooler first, and then the tank to the bulkhead was the easiest way of doing this. One home straight now with engine components, with just a small couple of pipes to fit. These again are fiddly, but more so for me than for you, as you don't have to worry about handling the aircraft wings and maintaining focus. Anyway, tweezers make this job in 192 relatively straightforward. Step 193 is a bit trickier since this pipe snakes back to the main spar, but actually it has two attachments, 
one to a pipe coupling and one on the engine frame that are easily accessible so you can ignore the wing one completely. The cowling oil chin tank is next for me, though it's step 183 in the instructions. It locates simply on four points on the lower engine frame and aligns perfectly. Next is step 187, which fits the extreme nose in front of the engine behind the spinner. This has three points which attach to the prop reduction gear housing. It's important to get this right since the framing attaches to this in the next steps. Steps 188 and 189 cover the port and starboard framing around the engine respectively, and these do require some patience, as they need to be positively located properly or your cowlings won't fit. They have three attachment points on the firewall side, plus the connection to the nose piece. Additionally, these are some of the most delicate parts in the entire kit, which is commendable from a scale point of view, but it does mean they could be easily bent or broken. Now that the engine is finished, it's time to weather it. The cooling pipes became discoloured in Spitfires very quickly, and Merlin engines in operational aircraft were kept working rather than spotlessly clean. The chin oil tank got a lot of staining, exhaust stained many of the components around them, and small leaks, drips, chips and scuffs were common. I'm replicating all of that with a mixture of weathering powders to start with. Once applied, I then wipe off most of this in areas I don't want it until I'm happy with the effect, at least for the time being. I'll come back and tweak this at the end of the build when everything else is painted. Next up is some secret weapon yellowish rust, which creates a nice stained yellow finish. Then I can go in with some secret weapon fresh oil, which is good at, you guessed it, replicating oil drips. Over all of that, I'm coming in with some diluted neutral grey Liquitex ink, just to create some surface variation to stop the engine from looking completely uniform. Finally, I'm coming back in with my oil wash, randomly spotted about and selectively pin washed into those areas that need darkening. So there we have it. The Merlin 63 recreated here is really solid. The real engines had a multitude more small connections on them, which would be easy to recreate with lead wire, so it's also a great foundation for super detailing. Still, just using what's presented in the kit is more than enough if you just want to be able to have one of the engine panels off for a diorama, for instance. There are a couple of really tricky assembly steps, the port cooling pipe being the worst offender, but everything fits beautifully. The one thing I really wish Airfix had done was to include decals for the Rolls-Royce logos on the engines, so I may end up making my own for those. In any case, the kit is rapidly approaching completion now, which I'll cover in my next video on this beautiful kit, so I hope you'll join me for that. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.